morning uh, today. And uh, uh, once again, it was great to be in your communities and uh, 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 meet you on, on your own turf and, and, and so on. So uh, it's amazing, you know, we're more than halfway through our program and moving from kind of some introductory things about uh, uh, getting the work done, the surveys, the vision statement, the provider interviews, looking at your maps, uh, to think about, okay, now what are we gonna do about this? And I, I understand your knowledge continues to grow about the first things where uh, I just talked about, but more and more and more, it's gonna be about what are we actually going to do? And today we're very lucky to have Doug Dawson with us Doug has a consulting firm, CCG, and it's a, uh, he's been. Consulting business uh, really probably has, in my mind, uh, it's, we, it's really unfortunate that our, uh, Doug is not head of MTIA because it would have been, we'd, uh, have that money out the door by now and and uh, with a set of rules that make sense uh, and uh, very strategic. But unfortunately, uh, that's not the case. And so Doug is helping community by community to help bring better broadband to uh, rural places. Uh, Doug's got a great uh, daily blog and we've promoted this before, but if you have not uh, taken us up on that and Reed will put the link in the chat, uh, for uh, his bl blog called Pots and Pans by CCG. And that's really, if you read that uh, every day, uh, within about six months, you're going to really increase your knowledge of what's going on both on the ground and uh, at the federal policy level. So I encourage you to, uh, to look at that and read it. It's uh, one of the great highlights of my broadband education has been formed by that blog and then Doug's presentations to our groups. So with that, I'm just going to welcome Doug and say thanks again for joining us and uh, sharing your knowledge. Well, thank you, Bill. As he said, I'm Doug Dawson. Um, you may see a cat tail go past your screen here. I've got a very annoying cat on my desk in the current minute. So, uh, uh, so what Bill asked me to talk to today is, is broadband feasibility studies. And this is something that I can talk to from great experience. I've probably done at this point, probably 500 of these over the years. Our business has been around for 26 years. And, and so a feasibility study says, let's look at a broadband opportunity. Can it be done in a way that is sustainable? I mean, that's the, the bottom line purpose of, of doing one. And so we've, we've done that for uh, many communities. We've done that for many commercial ISPs. Uh, and so that's just something that uh, is, is a core competency of ours. Uh, next slide. So today we're going to talk about the basics. You know, here's what's in a basic feasibility study, mapping analysis, market research, a gap analysis, pricing, uh, engineering cost study, financial analysis, discussion of funding, and then other stuff. And so we'll talk about each of these individuals, so we won't stay on this slide long. Next slide. Uh, nowadays, mapping is a critical part of it, and I think you've already been talking about mapping in your groups, but, uh, you know, unfortunately, we're, we are now in a, in a regime where we're stuck starting with what the FCC says the maps are, and I have never looked at a county yet where the maps are accurate, so they all have problems, and the problems come for many reasons. First, there's something called the mapping fabric, where, the, where a company called CostQuest has decided where every location is. And those are often 5, 10, 20% inaccurate. Uh, and so if you don't have, if you don't actually locate the right number of places, you don't have a good starting point for doing your analysis. What we always do in the feasibility study is we take the FCC's data. We also gather local data from GIS, from 911 databases, pretty much anything that we can find at the local level. And we talk to folks uh, and, and we come up with our own analysis to say what we think the number of locations are that can buy broadband. And, um, and that's what we do our study based on. And that also leads then to do a map challenge if we identify a lot of locations that are not in the FCC database. 
and so which is a very worthwhile uh, effort to undertake. So, and so the first thing we do is to try to count on our own uh, the the actual places that that have broadband today. We then overlay it. The FCC, one thing the FCC maps do well is they show you where ISPs claim to serve, uh, and so we can overlay that across the real map and find out how many people they claim to serve. The next thing we tackle then are those claims, and they really do those speeds. You know, we just I just finished a county where uh, there were, one of the big telcos had claimed two and three hundred megabit DSL in rural areas. It's like, no, that's not real. <laughs> uh, we also usually buy. Uh, a year trailing UCLA speed test, we can go, huh, that's kind of interesting claim there because the fastest speed we can find is 35 megabits for an entire year. And so, you know, so that the next step is to peel back the, the, the claims of ISPs to what they really are doing. Not, you know, speed tests are not individually accurate, but they're pretty darn accurate when you get thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of them. So when you when you get a whole lot of them, you start to get the real truth about what's going on. So. Uh, and so, so now we have all, so now what we've done is we've created a map of the real places. We start to map what we think the real speeds are. And now we're ready to talk about, you know, what's needed to solve the, the real locations that don't have broadband. That's often uh, in, in the county I just talked about that had the, the, the DSL, we actually found 2,000 more locations in that county that were not counted as underserved on the FCC maps. And so, so that's the mapping is not, it didn't used to be something we even did, but nowadays it's probably the critical step in the in the process. So and so we also send engineers out to actually go to look to see if we can find the technology. You know, the wireless carriers, you know, they'll be claiming all sorts of of uh, carriage areas. And it's like we can't find any towers. You know, this this is a phantom, you know, uh, in that same county, there was a large area of a thousand people that the, uh, one ISP had claimed uh, that they were serving with 100 plus megabits. They had one speed test for the whole last 12 months. It's like, this is this is a phantom ISP. So. And so we do all that kind of work to come up with these accurate maps. Um, next step, the next uh, slide, there you go. This is our, an example. So here's, here's this is a county, I don't remember which one this is, but this is what, ha this is the map if you map the FCC data. So this is what the FCC says in the county. Blue is unserved, yellow is underserved, meaning speeds between 25.3 and 100 megabits, and orange is served. So according to the FCC, which is not the FCC, according to all the ISPs, this is what they claim in this county. So they're claiming a pretty large chunk of it that has 100 megabits. Well, the next map is the real story. So that's the real story in this county. All that other stuff is really not there. And I mean, th this is, I believe this one is in New Mexico. This was the most exaggerated county we've ever looked at. It just wasn't there. I mean, it's just like the, the technologies weren't there. The coverage wasn't there. I mean, everything about it was pretty much bogus. And so, you know, this allowed a massive map challenge to go, you know, what they did have was they did have some actual areas that were covered with fiber and or cable companies along a couple major roads, everybody else was unserved. And so, you know, very, very different map. Uh, now, your county's not going to have this happen. We've never seen another one that this is this extreme, but it's not unusual to see 10 or 20 or 30 percent of the service area of the county re reclassified as blue, meaning they don't have good broadband. Um, next slide. Um, <clears throat> So then we also just do all sorts of market research. You're already in the midst of that, it sounds like. So we do uh, residential and business surveys. Uh, our, our company does both online surveys. We also do statistically valid telephone surveys. Um, and so the point here is to go out to the public, get as many surveys as you can get to start going to find out how they're doing. That sounds like you're exactly in the middle of that process. Very, very important. What we do as a consultant is we also interview key stakeholders. You don't have to do that because you are the key stakeholders and you know all these folks. But when we get to a county, we don't know anybody. So we talk to the librarians and the real estate agents, rural businesses, you know, public safety, you name it. We go through all those groups and we talk to them about their broadband experiences, what works, what doesn't work. That's, that's probably of the whole study. For us being outsiders, that's the most critical 
best way for us to understand what's really going on in the county. But, and those interviews, we find out the truth about what's going on. It's really, really useful. At the local level, you already know all this stuff. You, that's why you even have broadband groups, because you know what's not working. So uh, for larger uh, metro counties, we also do a lot of focus groups. You know, we will get all the librarians in a room rather than talk to one. We'll get all the folks who do public housing in a room and that sort of thing and do focus groups. So, you know, the, the point is, is to, you know, again, if, for an outsider, we have to learn what's going on. And they, these are all tools to, to understand how people feel about broadband and to learn what works and what doesn't work. So these are very useful procedures uh, that we have used for many, many years. So uh, next slide. <clears throat> A gap analysis says now, you know, let's look deeper at not just broadband speeds, because obviously that's pretty critical. That was the orange and blue map back there. Where the heck are the speeds really at? But we got to look at all the other issues too, affordability, computer usage, you know. So we so we look at all that. We really dig into the demographics. Uh, and there's a whole lot of reasons to dig into demographics. One is that a lot of grants really favor areas of, of low income folks and, and economically distressed areas. So we wanna make sure that we align all the mapping analysis with the places where it's easiest to get grants. So we do all that sort of work. Uh, again, we get a lot of this from some of this stuff from, uh, from the surveys, but we get an awful lot of it from external sources. There's been, there's things at the census and all sorts of other places that talk about these things. So again, all useful to pile these into a pile so you can tell the true story when you go to, to write a grant. So uh, next slide. Okay. It's also important to, to uh, look at prices, broadband prices. You would think that even with the large companies, you would think that their prices are the same everywhere and they are not. Um, you know, we, we will find even two cities next to each other where prices differ by 10 or $15. It's just amazing how real prices on the ground. So we ask people what they're paying. We research everybody. We go to, you know, we go to, we go to the, believe it or not, we go to all the complaint boards about the ISPs. Those are actually very useful uh, where people talk about their actual bills. We do all, we try to find out what the real bills are. This year, what we're finding is the, the average price we're now finding is around $79 a month for a household to get broadband. But that varies we have a few counties that are a little bit lower than that. We just studied one that was at 89. And so knowing that number is a really important starting point. And as you all probably already know, prices are higher in the rural areas than they are in the towns. You would think it's the other way around, but the folks in the rural areas are the ones paying for the ridiculous hotspots with data caps or the satellite services with terrible data caps. Uh, it's, not very, it's not an unusual for rural folks to be paying way over $100 a month for a really inferior broadband product. And so that all comes into the average. Um, you know, we also then, you know, just a horror story back during the pandemic, we were talking to folks who were paying 500 and a thousand dollars a month for a hotspot when their kids tried to use them to do homework. It was just unbelievable, the stories that we heard. Um, so so getting all that pricing is very useful because as you, as you start looking as a county to get ISP partners, you're gonna look for for partners who care about price. I mean, you're, you're not gonna want an ISP who their starting price for the cheapest product is $100. If there's another ISP, that'll be 55 or $60. So, but you kind of have to know what the prices are today before you can have a realistic discussion about that. Uh, we also usually in this section of the report talk about, um, you know, the, the whole issue of competition, you know, does competition really help pricing and just, you know, all those sort of issues related to competition. Um, next slide. The biggie is, is engineering analysis. So, uh, and we have engineers on staff and we also partner with several engineering firms. For the majority of our studies, we partner with a big engineering firm called Finley Engineering, but we also partner with a few others. And the key here is once we've got that map, and we say, here's the areas that are truly unserved and underserved. What does it cost to bring broadband to that? But we will look at whatever a county wants to look at. We'll look at fixed wireless, we'll look at fiber. And so we'll, you know, we will look at different options, uh, you know, bury in it, put it in on poles. And so, you know, the engineers go out, they drive around the county extensively, they figure out all the impediments to building fiber. 
Uh, they all have software nowadays that design networks. And these are pretty detailed designs. It'll say this street needs 24 fibers. This street needs 144 fibers because these other six routes are feeding into it. It's a very detailed analysis. We will decide where all the pedestals go at houses and just all that kind of detail in the study. And that ends up with a very complete cost analysis, which tells the county a whole lot. It's like, to fix our broadband problem, if we want fiber, it's going to be $23 million. You now have a number. Uh, and, and it doesn't matter if it's going to take one ISP to do it all or six of them. Collectively, they're going to spend in that range of numbers. And our numbers get validated all the time. We just uh, did a study for a county, and then uh, they were talking to one of the very large ISPs, one of the big cable companies who came back with an estimate of what it would cost them to build those areas. And they were within like a half a million dollar. So, you know, so, I mean, these are good solid engineering estimates uh, that, that sort of put it on. One of the main benefits of doing this analysis is we very often then hand these over to ISPs. And, and what'll happen there, ISPs say, I'm only interested in the Northeast corner and we can carve out the cost for that piece and give it to them. So now, you would be very surprised how hard it is for, for smaller ISPs to do that. They're not sitting around with these estimates of the cost of your network. You know, it's a whole lot of work to do this. And so when they can get a reliable estimate from an outsider, that we've actually found that that, that attracts them to come to your county because we just save them a ton of effort and they can actually see if this makes sense in a day instead of three weeks. And so, you know, so this is very useful to hand off to ISPs so yeah, what we do is for the client, and it's obviously available to anybody they want to give it to. Our product is not ours. It's, it's the client. So this, so this is very useful for uh, if you want to get an estimate of what it takes to do it. Occasionally, we get counties who, not many, but who even explore, you know, they, they take this to try to explore public-private partnerships or even doing some of it themselves. Uh, they go, you know, what happens if ISPs don't want to do the whole county? Can we do a piece of it? So. So this, this gives them the way to have that kind of thought process. So uh, next slide. Along with that, we do a financial analysis. And the financial analysis really aimed at the big question, how much grant do I need in this county to get this solved? You know, you know, is it, you know, again, we're back to the $23 million network. Is it 18 million? Is it 15 million? Is it 20 million? You know, what the, What does it take to make a business work there? And it's not, you know, the grants, everyone thinks of grants in terms of, well, this grant's going to give a 75% grant. And it's like, that's not the important question. What if you need 80% to make it work? No ISP wants to do a business plan where they can't be assured of covering their costs in the future. It's got to work financially. And so, and that all boils down to, it goes back to the engineering study the number one driving force for both the cost and for these grants is the number of passings per road mile. And so, you know, if, and it's so funny because I hear from folks all the time, like in New Hampshire, they go, we don't know why these Western folks are complaining so much about it. We don't have any problem building rural networks here. And it's like, yeah, you have 20 houses for every road mile. So when you go out to these counties, they have three. Like, do you see the difference between those two? The fiber, the mile fiber costs the same, but it's very different to use that fiber to serve three people and 20 people. So, so you know, that's what drives these grants. And so if you know, if you look at the Illinois grant rules, their number one criteria for BEAD is going to be cost per passing. And that's exactly what we're talking about here. That is, that's like the biggest chunk of their grant points are going to be based on that. And, you, and it is what it is. You can't make it, you can't make it a smaller number. The cost of my network is X. And here's the number of people I serve. It's cost to get to those, and so, uh, but that you know that they're hoping, they're hoping it all comes in low, and it's not. In fact, as rural areas, uh, in, in Illinois, the differences from I, we've worked now with I think seven or eight counties, the cost differences between them are tremendous because the density is so different. Um, it's very, very different and much more costly to build an area with farms than it is to build to a county that has small pockets of clusters of 20 homes. I mean, they're, they're just massively different costs to do that. So, and so this financial analysis is really important because it helps to explain why you need certain levels of grants. And it also can assure an ISP in some cases where they don't need all that grant, 
it's very useful to know that you're fine with a 50% grant. That way you don't have to ask for the 75% and get rejected. You can ask for something lower and win the grant. So um, these studies also look at, we also look at alternate business plans. Again, we'll look at public private partnerships and whatever else the county wants to look at. So uh, some counties have us look at open access and, and actually some of them have been talking to ISPs who are interested in open access. So so we say, let's let's show you the math for an open access provider being successful in this county. So, uh, so you know, we look at whatever you know it is they're interested in looking at. So, uh, next slide. <clears throat> Obviously, these days, funding means looking at grants, um, but it also much more than that is looking at the matching funds. The 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 problem with ISPs is not the amount of grant they they get. The, the question for them is always. If they're not Comcast and Charter, the question is, where do I get the money to pay for the rest of it? And so that, you know, most counties really hope that their local good, high quality ISPs can make this work. And and even though a lot of those companies have been around 100 years, they are not sitting on big cash reserves. You know, so the electric co-ops and the telephone co-ops and the telephone companies and the CLEX and the fiber over builders, these smaller companies really struggle. And so we talk, and our, we, our studies, we look at ways for them to think how to raise this money. And then we often, I personally help those guys raise money. That's one of my key things that I do in life is to help CLEX find this money. So, you know, we, let's go to the bank and talk to them and show them why this can work sort of thing. So, and so, you know, helping these small, you know, the typical small telephone company has never tried to do a $20 million project. Wow, that's a really big thing to do. So they, you know, we have to help them figure out how to make this thing work. So that that's the other thing the study looks at is how the heck do you make the money work? So um, next slide. And then uh, counties often they usually hire us to do feasibility studies based on an RFP, and they often ask all sorts of other questions. They, you know, and some of these are very useful, like the benefits of broadband. Every grant asks you to talk about that. So we typically get asked to talk about that. They always, almost always ask us, how do we take the study and actually find ISP partners with the county? Um, they often want to know about industry trends, what's going on with broadband. And and, uh, and you don't want me to start on that because Bill and I could talk about that for about three days, I think. So uh, they often want an operational analysis, meaning they're just curious how ISPs work and how ISPs make money. What what do they actually do all day to, to justify you know the, the rates that they charge? A lot of counties are actually just very nosy about that topic. They often ask about legal and regulatory issues. Some states have a lot of regulatory barriers, and they're going to want to know about those. For example, in Michigan, there's all sorts of weird rules you have to get around. A lot of a lot of states have very weird. I'm in North Carolina. There's all sorts of weird grant rules here. Even just to get the big grants, there's more rules here than there are in other states because of regulations that the legislators passed. So they usually want to understand those things. They're very much everybody wants to understand timelines. What if, what if this, what if we do talk somebody into getting a grant? How long until we actually get broadband? And they're very disappointed when I tell them it's three or four years. But that you know we can show them how long it takes to build a twenty million dollar network. It's like you know here's here's the way it really works. So. Uh, we often work with re, you know regional collaboration. Uh, we'll talk to multiple counties. We've often done many studies where it's two or three neighboring counties at the same time because they want to go after a solution together. Uh, what's not on here, which I should have put on, I just forgot to update it. Nowadays, we talk a lot about digital equity. You know, where do I? Because there's a huge amount of there's billions of dollars available for digital equity grants, and we talk about how do you go get those? What what what's the best? strategy for this particular county to get their fair share of that money because it's it's not automatic it's not it's not like arpa where you just get it because you're there you have to really have a plan to go pursue it and and so we by this time we know them well and we know all the players and we can say for you you got to do it one of these three ways if you and you got to start now here's what you got to do to get this money so um <clears throat> i think that's mostly it is there more slides i think that was my last slide there's who i am uh, there's, I think he already posted it. There's my uh, blog, Pots and Pans by CCG. Feel free to email me at my email address. So love to hear from you guys. Um, any questions? I think that's next, Bill. Yeah, thanks so much, Doug. And uh, I think Doug makes it all seem pretty simple, but 
Doug is. Been- oh, it, it, it's not simple. It's simple because we have eight guys who do this for a living, and they, they there's a whole lot of work to do on these studies. Yes. So. <laughs> yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about uh, when you talk to prospective ISP partners? You know what what are they looking for from a community in terms of being a good partner and bringing either data or money or support? First thing you got to understand is, and this this is where a lot of counties get tripped up. If you ask all the local ISPs if they're interested in partnering with you, they all say yes. And you go, man, there's a lot of interest in partnering with us. It's like, no, they just say yes because they want to hear more. <laughs> it doesn't mean they're really interested in partnering. Right? So, because what an ISP wants to learn is the same thing we have in the study. What's it going to cost to serve in your county? What is it that what is it you're asking them to serve? They are not sitting around with all this information already digested. So, you know, so show us a map of the area you're talking about, how many people live there. Oh, you have a cost estimate of building it. Now you start feeding them the facts, you start finding out who's interested. Half of them will fall away. They go, nah, that's too, that's not densely populated enough, but we're going to pass on that opportunity. And so, you know, so normally the process is, um, and, and it goes the range. It goes from very informal. You pull them all in and talk to them one by one. A lot, of, a lot of counties do RFIs where you simply ask them to give you information about themselves. And in doing that, usually you lay out the possibilities. Here's the areas, you know, you did a feasibility study. Here's the areas that we think are eligible for broadband grants. Are you guys interested in serving it? And then you that's open. So now you've got a map in front of them. That opens up the diagram. Some county, their purchasing folks say they have to do that with an RFP. And that's normally for counties who are actually going to give money out. So if you're going to make local grant, which is ISPs love that. And in fact, the Illinois grant rules, if I re, I work in so many states, I'm, I should have looked it up this morning. I think they give you something like 6% of all the grant points for the local participation. So they're, they definitely give extra money for to communities where the community gives some financial support. And you don't have to give a lot. I mean, you know, if you gave a hundred thousand dollars to an ISP, it shows local support. But and most a lot of communities still have ARPA money set aside and they're using that money to make these local grants. I mean, we're actually helping several Illinois communities through that process of who do I give grants to. So um I bought the hay fever season started yesterday here. Um so, but you know, so they do want money, but they don't want you to build their network. I mean, they're not going to come and ask you for half the money. If they do, you're just going to have to laugh at them because nobody has that much money to give to an ISP. But, uh, but they do love financial support. The other interesting thing is, counties have a lot of power right now because you're not required to give. You know, in the past, you gave everybody a letter of of support for grants, right? And the B grants they get points for a letter of support. So if you have a favorite ISP and you only give that company a letter of support, then you're going to give them a boost up in the, in the grant process. That's a very important power that you've never had before. So that that's, an, that's I mean, that's the first time ever. You still may decide politically you should give it to everybody, but if you have one or two favorite ISPs and you give them the points, you've given them a better chance of winning the grants. So, uh, and that's that puts com- counties in a very uncomfortable, position sometimes like well do i want to tell the other guys i don't support them i mean that's but the fact is they the state of illinois has given you that power in the b grant process so it's a it's a so you you're gonna they're gonna come they're gonna come knock on your doors for these letters of support very soon here once they once the mapping challenge is underway which i think might start next week so um so yeah so be prepared to have isps come in with their hand out for money and asking for a letter of support. And you're going to go, huh, what do I do now? So, um, so, <laughs> so. Well, we try and we try and get the community to have a vision for what it is that's good enough for them. So which they can benchmark yes. what a provider is yes. promising them, you know, yes. ubiquitous or uh, speed or affordability. Oh yeah. So, yeah. So you ask the provider then what they're going to do now, if they're going to pursue a grant, they have to cover everybody. So we already know that, but you certainly care what their prices are. You certainly care the technology they use. You care how, you know, what kind of speeds. <laughs> I ran across an ISP the other day, has a fiber network, and they start with packages of 25 megabits. It's like, 
I was, I was just puzzled. It's like, really? <laughs> it's like, why would you do that on fiber? And their top package was 200 megabits. Like you have fiber, you know, why would you restrict yourself to that? But that's what they offer. And it's a little co-op. So, so you definitely have to ask those questions because you can't assume that a fiber guy is going to offer gigabit and that it's affordable. There's also, there was a big, subsidy program called RDOP a few years ago and some of the ISPs in there their starting prices are $110 and the counties they're working in nobody can afford it so that's a you know prices are massively important issues so any advice for the counties on you know if they you know five years ago when we looked at these maps they're just vast areas of unserved areas and now it's more of that checkerboard due to reconnect grants or RDOP commitments What's what's your take on how to assemble new projects with this complicated map? Well, what what we've been doing again, and while we're doing these RFIs, we typically send out that map. Here's what we think the right area is. Are you interested in? We divide the county into three or four or five or six segments, and. What we want to, what you want to make sure is that some ISP is interested in every piece of the county. It doesn't do, it doesn't do any good if all all of them are interested in the south and nobody's interested in the north. It's like, well, that north is the farms where it's not very dense. We need somebody to come up there. So, and so, <clears throat> asking them where they want to serve and trying to talk them into going to those various places. You also have to look at your the other questions. You have to look at the neighboring counties. A lot of times you'll have a pocket that's just slight, it's separate from everything else. But if you look at the county next door, it goes way up into another unserved area. And so, you know, so there you have to say, hey, are you going to do this as part of going after this much larger farming area here? So, and so you kind of have to look at the boundaries as well, because some of those pockets are not really pockets they're the edge of a much larger service area. So, uh, but it is a real mess. There are counties where it looks like a checkerboard. The, the all the current grants have left you know ten different little pockets which don't make any business sense, uh, and so that's a that's a dilemma. But we still have to try to find somebody to solve, to serve it. And the, and the and the way you do that is you talk to your ISPs, you have honest conversations with the maps in front of you both, and you go, "There's a lot of grant money. Can't you please make this work?" I mean, it, you know, that, there's not much more to it than than getting them in the room one by one and hoping. That, beyond hope that somebody's interested in all of it, so. And I, I don't see any questions in the chat or hands raised, so I'm gonna keep asking my questions. Uh, what, a lot of providers obviously like to edge out from where they are, and then, uh, you know, but how do you, what's the argument for just trying to bring in somebody completely new and cover, you know, whether it's be a competitive provider, we know that incumbents, Many times don't improve their networks until there is competition. What's your what's your take? This all, this all comes down to local philosophy because there's a giant difference between small ISPs and co-ops and the giant telcos and the giant cable companies. And not to say that any of those are good and bad, but they're a very different way they approach the business, right? And so, you know, part of that. <clears throat> In most counties, you already know a couple of ISPs. You know how they've done in the past, and people either like them or don't like them, and that's your starting point. If nobody likes the cable company, then do I really want to invite them to go to all the rural areas when the people in town can't stand them? So that, you know, understanding how people feel about it, which is something you get out of the surveys if you ask the right questions, is a starting point. But but beyond that, you know, there's, a, for example, right now there's a whole lot of equity funded brand new ISPs who never existed before chasing B grants. Do you trust a company who's never done it before in your county? What if they fall flat on their face? We know they have a lot of money because they have a lot of equity behind them. That doesn't mean they're any good at being an ISP. So, so do I trust new companies? Do I prefer little companies? Do I prefer big companies? And counties have very, do I, do I, am I happy if it's wireless as long as people get something? You have to have those discussions before you pick an ISP partner, because you will have a preference. If you get if you get the 10 people in the county who most care about broadband in a room and have the discussion, which is what I suspect you all have done in these committees, you're going to have opinions. And, and the opinions are going to be based upon all those factors. You know, do, you know, the big guys 
have lots of money, but are there, is their customer service any good? The little guys might have great customer service, but is this too big of a project for them? You have to have those discussions with your specific ISPs. Uh, and usually, usually a one or two of them will end up at the top of your list as favorites. And it could be large companies and it could be small companies, but the point is you've come to a consensus of who you like. So, uh, and that's, and that's who you would probably want to give your grant support letters to. So. Yeah. And we have, uh, we do, uh, when we do our surveys, we can see those satisfaction or yeah. dissatisfaction levels by provider, yeah. by uh, technology. <clears throat> and so that's really informative to uh, the leaders. And then our final question is always tell us your broadband story. And uh, yeah. a full third of the comments start with the name of the incumbent provider <laughs> and then a very brief <laughs> but expressive adjective at the uh yes so you have to edit those before you publish them right <laughs> <laughs> yes uh, no but you also get people who are very happy with their isp not everybody is unhappy so yeah so but you you would really want to hear those stories because you know it's okay if an isp is an outage but what happens if do they come out and fix it right away or do they let you sit there for two weeks because if they let you sit there for two weeks, what makes you think if they build fiber, they're not going to let you sit there for two weeks? So that's the kind of things you need to think about in picking the ISPs. So it's still the same company. You know, it's like, well, they did not visit me because they had DSL. They just didn't visit me, you know, because they don't have enough people. Are they going to hire more people? Probably not. So so that that's the kind of company. And, and, and they might, and it might be, they came out immediately to help me, but they just couldn't fix it because the network was bad. But at least they, you know, at least they were very responsive. So those things all matter, right? So yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but, you know, a lot of our territory is, you know, uh, Illinois heartland. You know, yeah. it, uh, you can see for miles, and you can uh, plow for miles with your fiber plow. What what kind of densities? What do you see as the break even point for? territory like that how many houses per mile well you have to first of all you have to look for road mile not for square mile road miles what matters you know in farming areas where we've all these crisscrossed little roads that only two people live on and that's not the worst place to build a network so add up your miles of roads in the rural areas then divide by the number of houses so a lot of people look at it per square mile and that's just not because there's places where everybody lives along three roads. Like, well, then that they're actually fairly densely populated. So, um, and so, so you start there. It gets it, at twenty people per mile. A cable company will build there. So that's that's an area where there's a business plan without a grant. So if you have twenty people per road mile, and not just for one mile, but there's enough of an area that has that kind of number. And ISPs are willing to go spend their own money to serve that area. That's that's an area where they can make a they can make money without a grant. As it starts dropping, then it gets more and more grants needed. So if you're down at 15, you need some grant, but you don't need 75% grant. You might need 25% grant. And by the time you get down to five people per road mile, you need lots and lots of grants. I mean, because it's still the same cost per mile as it is for the place with 20 people. There's just there's a fourth of the revenue to cover it. And all of a sudden there's only five houses. And so that, so it's, it all boils down to that number. And we're seeing in, in the counties I've studied in Illinois, anywhere, the lowest one I've worked on so far has only got four houses per mile. Again, not for the whole county, for these areas that are needy. You know, don't, if you do that math for the whole county, the cities will make it look good. So it's only for, count that for the rural area. So you're, if you're down at three or four per mile, you're going to need 80 or even 90% grants possibly. You know, most places are going to be around the range of six or seven. So, and, and so they're, if they're at six or seven houses per mile, they're going to easily fit under the B grants and they're going to get funded pretty easily. So when it gets below that, it gets to be a massive challenge. Uh, I did studies in New Mexico where it was a half a home per road mile. It's like, you can imagine what that looks like. So dollar wise, so <laughs> How do you see precision ag changing the equation for rural? Well, interestingly, I just wrote a blog that'll probably be published next week. Um, John Deere just made a, a, a an arrangement with Starlink. They're actually going to build Starlink receivers into all of their smart gear now. So that'll start by about June or July of this year. Uh, and so, I, and waste the way they're going to do it is it'll it'll start with 
cellular and the cellular doesn't work if I use the satellite. So that's going to solve smart tractor problem. They're going to have either cellular or satellite almost everywhere. Uh, that doesn't solve the farmhouse and the farm operation. And the fact is those guys nowadays, when I interview farmers, I've, I have had four different farmers in the last two months who said to me, I feel more like an IT guy than I do a farmer. <laughs> they, they, you know, all I do is crunch data and I have to work with all these different IT systems. And they go, boy, did I ever learn a lot in the last three years. Right? And so they need a lot. They need big broadband at their house. They need, they don't get fired. And they're struggling because if they have these very bad alternatives, they're really hurting. You know, they have to, you know, they want to upload terabit files so they can get accurate maps of where they need to fertilize and all that kind of stuff. And so the, their problem is the farmhouse. The fields are actually going to be taken care of. Now, the other the other manufacturers are not going to let John Deal steal the market. They're all going to have one next year, too. They're, they're not going to let them be the only one that has that. So, that, so that's been lacking. Right now, in, currently, if you drive out, a, if you don't have good cellular coverage, your smart hag didn't really work very well. That's going to fix that. So, uh, so that that's a very big news, but that doesn't fix the farmhouses. We still need a broadband solution for the farmhouses because they're data centers nowadays. They, they crunch massive amounts of data. So, just go ask them. It, it's it's amazing what they have to do every year. So, how about some counties think? Oh, if we build a middle mile network, you know, from town to town, that will support rural fiber deployment. Do you see that happening? Rarely, rarely has that worked. It only works if before you build it, all the ISPs agree that that will solve the broadband problem. They will, an ISP who's already agreed to come there will gladly let you do that because that's something they don't have to build and it makes it affordable. But but if you just build it and they will come and you've never had anybody lined up to come, there's a chance that nobody's going to use it. Um, so it, it works if it's part of a bigger strategy where you already know who those partners are. Then it's a great idea. If you do it just to do it, you're probably throwing your money away. Because what's going to happen there is Comcast or Charter or AT&T or somebody's going to win one of these big grants and they're not even going to use your network. And so it's like, well, gee, that kind of got built for no reason whatsoever. So, um, so it works as long as it's part of a bigger plan that has partners identified. Then it can be very, very effective. So... Any perspective on Illinois' uh, right-of-way and easement requirements? They're one of about 20 states who have not have got it wrong. So the legislature just has to fix it. You know, they just have to fix it. I mean, right, it goes back to when the electric wires were put up 100 years ago. The way they wrote the easement was it was for electric service. They could have just sort of said this was to put up utility, and then they would have been fine. States who wrote it that way don't have a problem. But now people are saying, yeah, but what you wanted to put on the wires now is not electric. So I, you need a brand new easement. There's a, a states like Virginia and a whole bunch of others have already fixed that problem. It's literally Virginia fixed it with a two sentence law. So they said for easement purposes, broadband fits under the old easements law, you know, and it's real, but they have, the legislature has to pass it. Otherwise, for right now, I mean, I help, I'm helping a electric co-op in Illinois build a fiber network and they are going out and knocking on every door and they have to buy easements and there's always a few people who are, are holding them up with highway robbery to get those easements and so it's a very big problem and it's costly and it delays building the fiber um, so pound on your legislatures to get a change because it's not a hard change i'm not sure what what's taking them so long to fix it so you know it's um uh there aren't many rural places that have uh, multiple uh, ISPs looking. Oh, I want to come and build in your county. Let's get a project going. How do you? How does a community, you know, stay strong? I guess in negotiations and kind of uh, be able to press their advantage. Is that um, now letter of support? Is that their trump card? Letter of support is your trump card. Yes, sir. And if if you don't support it. It's you're not picking the winner, but you're helping somebody be a winner. If you give the letter of support to only one ISP, they do have an advantage over others. Others may have more grant points for other reasons, so that it's not automatically going to do it. But it, but it it could make the difference. You could be picking the winner. So, 
broadband offices certainly are going to support the one you want. That that's an automatic proof of who you prefer, especially if you give them a two hundred thousand dollar grant and a letter of support, and you don't give anybody else anything. That they know that's who your county wants, and and your broadband office is very sensitive to the local concerns. They they want you all to be happy with the end result of these grants, and so they're going to support the local company to the extent they can. So, um, the you know grant points are always fluid they can pick winners by grading them in certain ways that they really want to <laughs> so 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 your local your local preferences can influence the state broadband grant office yes so we've seen um and especially like an electric co-op they might start with some fixed wireless as a strategy then to build a customer base and then deploy fiber long term is that still a viable strategy? Are you seeing that happen now? It's, first of all, I would, I've been I've been a supporter of that strategy for the last decade, and it was a great strategy. But now the B grants are available. It's a terrible strategy. You have the chance to go straight to fiber, and, and the trouble with the wireless to fiber is it takes ten or twelve years before you build up enough money to even think about building fiber. And so here you have the chance to go straight to fiber. So right because of the grant money, that doesn't make the slightest bit of sense now. Because if you take that grant money and build fixed wireless, first off, it's going to go to an I, you know, the fixed wireless guy, is he going to come back and build the fiber? You're taking you're taking that big chance. He may be very happy with fixed wireless for 20 or 30 years. So, you know, the, there's no guarantee that your money's actually going to be going to do that. You know, I know a lot of electric co-ops, including two in Illinois, who started that way and now are chasing the grants and actually won grants to upgrade the fiber. So for them, it was great. Uh, but uh, but it, to start there today is bad strategy. So Good, good. Any final advice for our communities as they're creating their plans and chasing ISPs and Grant funds. Talk to talk to everybody. Get your ISPs in. Have heart to heart talks with them. Uh, be, you know, so many counties don't even know all their ISPs. It's surprising to me how many. They're like, oh, I didn't even know those guys. Like they've been in your county for a hundred years. <laughs> what do you mean you don't know those guys? You know, look, it's this is the time to go out and and really get to know them. And in doing that, you're going to find out some of them you may not like it's like that's this is the time to find out because they're once you hear what their business plans are like you know i mean you're, you're going to meet isps who go we have no interest in expanding well then they're not going to be chasing the grants you need to find that out so you're not assuming what folks are going to do so yeah so that that's the most important thing to do right now so good thanks any questions from the from the crowd Kind of a shy group, Doug. Yeah, that's surprising. I've never known Illinois people to be one bit shy. <laughs> well, good. Um, Doug, again, thank you so much. Uh, this is great information and I think extremely valuable for the community folks and a lot to digest as a, you know, now when we Talk about ownership and partnership models here next week, and then on the uh, financing, and and then we're that. heavy into our little bit of ag stuff and little good projects meeting, but then right into the plan. So uh, that, really that's the right topics. To You're doing it. That's exactly what you need to be talking about. So excellent. Good, good, Doug. Thank you so much. Uh, your slides will make available, and of course, this recording, so folks can share it around their communities as well. All right. Well, I appreciate meeting you all today. So good luck on getting your bride, man. <laughs> Thanks, so, yeah. Doug. Well, yeah. Um, so we're a little bit early, but uh, uh, no problem with that to jump into the breakout rooms or if people have any questions for me or our team. Hi, this is Vicki Shalapo. Hi, Vicki. Okay, so I had a question earlier, and I don't know if in the mapping there is one way to tell this or not. 
And maybe I'm not sure what I'm talking about, which is always very possible. So let me um, look at the question. I've got to find it on my email. I'm sorry, but I just wanted to do this. So if somebody, so there's this thing where, okay, yeah. So the question came about earlier, we were, we were passing it around in our group that where the municipality owns the conduit, the pipes in the ground, and they open the pipes to any carrier who wants to put them in their fiber line in, in the pipe for a fee. So there's that happens. And then, <clears throat> so the question is who, who owns that line? Well, it would be the provider whose fiber it is. Okay. Okay. So yeah, they, uh, uh, you know, sometimes municipalities, and I'm just going to do a little advertisement here in about a week, there's going to be a handbook published by the American Association for Public Broadband. Uh, I, I'm the author of that, and uh, it's been a lot of great input from both the AAPB uh, leadership and uh, Benton team uh, to kind of do some guides about you know different roles for public sector in broadband. And so we see some communities choose to do the conduit strategy when they've got their roads open, and then they uh, allow one or more providers to access that conduit. Uh, multiple fibers, fiber bundles can uh, live in, in a single conduit, and sometimes they put mini conduit inside a bigger conduit where providers can have their own uh, separate uh, conduit essentially within the conduit, but whoever then owns that fiber is the one that's going to be able to control who gets to make use of it. But that's okay. not necessarily an exclusive arrangement. You could have multiple providers in that bundle. Other communities decide to put the fiber in, and then they might have a 200 fiber bundle in that uh, in the conduit, and then they can lease or sell off or, you know, they call them uh, IRUs, which is a legal term, essentially a lease where they can, uh, they might lease 12 fibers to one company and 20 or 40 to another company. And so that, that's a strategy that works uh, both in urban areas and in and, uh, uh, suburban areas. I, it'd be hard to just put conduit in the ground out in the rural countryside, I think. You know, the conduit is the the major expense. When you're digging, that's really the expense. The fiber you put in the conduit is relatively uh, cheap. I won't say free, but relatively cheap compared to the, the cost of burying that conduit. But it's okay. a smart idea if you have uh, open trenches in your community for new sewer, water, gas lines and so on okay all right thank you mm -hmm. bill i should have asked this when doug was talking but would it be possible um, for someone to retrieve uh, virginia's um policy that we could share with um, the illinois uh, telephone cooperative association and just see if they want to lobby or <clears throat> carry that information forward in terms of the easement sure. issue. <clears throat> yeah, Reed, Reed's, Reed's committed now to find that, and I'm sure it can't be too hard to find. So, And there's probably other multiple examples of states dealing with these rights-of-way issues uh, where they're uh, um, uh, trying to transform their right away system into one that's less of a barrier for broadband. Yeah, I think either, um, you know, I would give it directly to Randy Nert, who is our um, director for the Telco Association, or ask one of our ISPs if they wanted to carry that forward. Yeah, and the counties, I know the Farm Bureau, this is a big interest of theirs, and, uh, uh, you know, getting the Farm Bureau on that side of the equation politically would be a, a great thing to 
think about in your county having those discussions and understand their perspective and see if there is a way to uh, come to a, an agreement so that one person can't stop a fiber bundle from going down a right away. So there is a, a, a Nancy points out that it may well find that handbook from the Farm Bureau uh, about uh, managing easements and other other land use. Yeah, so that was written. There's a guide sheet that, that the Farm Bureau and Township officials of Illinois worked on together. But it's still like his, the issue that he brought up is the issue of putting items on poles. And that's mm -hmm. what um, the group in uh, in Scott County, that um, Western Illinois Rural Electric Co-op um, <clears throat> had an award. And when they got ready to implement, they were in these negotiations that, that really derailed their whole plan. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's a, uh, I know the provider and we're gonna actually hear from him later on uh, from uh, up in Northwest Illinois, uh, Jesse Sheckleton and he's, you know, they want to follow the rules and you know, their customers for electric are their same ones they're trying to get easements for, for broadband and just, even if everyone is agreeable, just the administrative work to make that happen is quite a barrier of getting people to sign legal agreements with legal descriptions and so on. So it, it, um, it it's now uh, over a million dollars they've spent uh, on trying to get easements. And if you think, well, if you can, cost per household might be even $20,000 in the rural area. That's a lot of houses that... Uh, they're not serving because they had to spend their funds on, on the, uh, on the rights of way in the easements. Nancy uh, put in the um, the counts. We see Perry at two hundred three on the surveys. Clinton six twenty five, Logan one eighteen, Cumberland six twenty three, Macon four eleven, and Crawford two twenty eight. So those are uh, really coming along and uh, appreciate your efforts there. And we've got about two more weeks uh, to get those surveys done. And so a big push now would be important. And so work with Nancy on understanding where you might have, excuse me, gaps in those coverage areas and uh, uh, she'll help you the best she can. Bill, one more question before we leave today. This is Vicki again. Is there a cheat sheet on 10, 10 fast steps on how to go through and do the challenges to take information that we get from the surveys and make sure we have the challenges before the, because there's just that four day cutoff. And, you know, that's, I, I'm, I'm concerned that there's just not gonna be enough time to go in and do the challenges that we need to do in that four days. Yeah, let's our team will put our head together on that and see what we can do in cooperation with the state of Illinois. Okay, thank you. Another thing I'll put on Reed's list, but between Reed and Shabika, there should be some pretty good information there. And if it's not, we'll try and create it quickly. Well, I, I know I attended that luncheon yesterday and I didn't real or, you know, the Zoom call at noon. And I didn't realize how important that was. And that was just a, a great, great Zoom call. But boy, I, you know, it left me, uh, yeah, uh, kind of gasping for air at the end of it. Okay. Yeah. And we'll include a link to that uh, uh, meeting uh, recording so that you guys can have that too, uh, that everyone can see if they want to attend that and, you know, Listen to Doug talk about the work they've done on that in other states was really interesting. Okay, thank you. And just to add some reassurance, I think that with the survey data coming in, one thing that counties need to be doing with looking at that is take stock of where the unserved and underserved um, clusters end up being. Um, as a, a way to guide and compare with what the current maps say, which um, if you remember, Shubika had that on week three, 
Um, and so the B challenge is kind of looking to update the data on both those maps, I believe. And so um, using what we get from the surveys to guide you in your outreach so that you can organize with any maybe nonprofits in a, an area of a cluster that could help to get people to submit a challenge to the to the map. And it's a series of speed tests in a span of three, a three day period. And so there is a little bit of a front load of information that has to be used to do the outreach. But I think that's probably one at this time, it's probably one of the main outreach implications for some of the survey data that you're gonna see. Okay, okay. so if they, if someone does that three time B challenge, does that mean as as a committee, we don't have to go in and try to do a challenge? Um, it, I think it's local governments and nonprofits, but Shabika might be on the line. She's also gearing up to deliver in person a program today here at the conference. So I think she's not here online, but I would want her to almost just chime in to make sure um, that that's the case. But what what I have heard from Devin Bronstein on these webinars so far is that they're really working with local governments, you know, units of government, it could be a township as well, um, as well as nonprofits that can kind of take on, so, you know, maybe economic development um, corporations or something local, um, local economic development types of organizations that can work to help batch the information in some cases. Again, I don't want to give too much information without being the main source. So those okay. Wednesday webinars, though, it's important to go at least to one of them. Um, and then you can ask questions real, just very specific. And they're going to have office hours. Uh, so okay. there's an opportunity yeah. to ask direct questions. And of course, they'll take do an intake for you as well. And so that just helps get everybody organized. Okay. Nancy, are the timelines? I, I'm not. I'm not sure that I follow the timeline because right now we're in essence doing speed tests with our yeah. surveys that we're doing. So it, when we get our data back from our, our surveys, will there still be time? Um, it, it, what's the close date of when they want to stop collecting data from the speed tests? Do our timelines uh, um, work originally? When yeah, originally when they said they would open it up um, and th that the portal would be live, that it would be open for several weeks. So that portal just went live this past week. And so um, right now, you know, with the survey language as well, you'd want to add something um, pretty much at that time, you know, so I can give my best go at it. But really, I, I do want to make sure that you're getting the proper outreach materials. So um we had mentioned Nancy? the info sheet, so Shubika can probably provide that to read um, just to double check that that's the correct one. Nancy? Yes. We have some calls to open the breakout rooms because people have guests that they're going to be talking to and everything. So could you do that? Sounds good. I know the challenge process is a huge thing. And uh, uh, I appreciate the complexity and the challenge to participate in the challenge thing. So we'll try and keep you all informed on that. I'm going to put this at, is 65 minutes okay? Yeah. Okay. Just because of leaving. Um, and Reed, thank you for staying on for the, let's also 